Cirilla, you are the lion cub of Sintra. Why do you think she's not safe? I saw an army. A sea of black and gold. The of God will destroy everything. Toss a coin to your witcher, oh valley, oh valley. I don't know the words though. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Look It All podcast. This is your host, Elias Roush. I don't know why I had to think about that, but um, this podcast is sponsored by EliasRoushMedia.com, photo, video, digital media production. Today we are discussing The Witcher on Netflix. The Witcher is an American fantasy drama series based by, sorry, produced by Lauren Schmidt Hirsch. His Rich. His Rich, I think. It is based on the book series of the same name by the Polish writer Andrzej Sabaski. Sabaskos. Sabaski. Sorry, these Polish names I'm going to just straight murder like Geralt. Um, so apologize. Uh, ap- apologies for that. The first season, let me see. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Lug It All podcast. This is your host, Elias Rouse. Today, we're discussing The Witcher, television series available on Netflix. The Witcher is an American fantasy drama series produced by Lauren Schmidt Hisrich. It is based on the book series of the same name by the Polish writer Andrzej Sabaskoski. I'm sorry, I'm going to get all those names wrong, uh, the Polish names wrong. I'm dearly sorry to the Polish. Um, the first season, consistent of eight episode episodes, was released on Netflix in its entirety on December 20th. So, I will say that The Witcher was something I was completely not excited for, and... Strictly best because I was not involved in playing any of the video games. I was not involved in any of the uh, any of the books, any of the video games, any of the behind the scenes lore, all of that stuff. Very much in the dark. So I'm coming to this as someone that just likes watching television movies and has no lore knowledge. So I just wanted to get that out of the way for anything that if I get anything wrong or the names of the places of the things, the things of the sorcery or the whatever that, uh, you know, just bear with me as I learn, because I very much feel like this is me kind of stepping my toe into Game of Thrones lore again. And uh, I I know how hard that was for a lot of people to get into. And I feel like this is a slightly little bit more difficult as well for people that uh, are unfamiliar with it. So um, let me see. Set in a medieval fictional world on a landmass known as the Continent, The Witcher follows the story of a solidarity monster hunter, Geralt of Rivera, played by Henry Cavill, sorceress Yennefer of Vinbeg, played by Anya Charlotta, and Sintran Princess Ciri, played by Freya Allen, who find their destinies tied together. The first season is based on The Last Witch, and The Sword of Destiny, a collection of short stories which precede the main Witcher saga. It explores formative events that shape the three lead characters prior to the first encounters with each other. So let me pull up my um, my Witcher notes real quick. Let me just talk about a couple of the things that I noticed about this show. One, everyone is going to refer to this as um, the Netflix Netflix's Game of Thrones. There's a couple of reasons I would compare it to it and a couple of reasons I wouldn't compare it to it. So first things first, why does it look like the Game of Thrones? Um, why does it look why does it visually look like Game of Thrones? Well, for the most part, it does a pretty good job of aping the visual style of Game of Thrones because it has some of the same behind the scenes um, you know text behind there. 
running the being a director cinematographer there's tons of people that have come from the game of thrones world over to the witcher world specifically the first direct the first director of the series alik sarkov sakharov i think um and <clears throat> he is best well known for being a cinematographer on uh Game of Thrones and a director on Ozark, Gypsy, Black Sails, Goliath, other things. Um, and he was also a director on Game of Thrones as well. Season 2, Episode 3, What is Dead and It May Never Die, The Climb in Season 3, um, and Season 4, The Laws of God and Men, and Mockingbird in episode, is Episode 7 in Season 4 of Game of Thrones. So, yeah, he's directed a lot as well. So, a lot of Game of Thrones as well. The problem is when you go into The Witcher is you're like, oh shit, oh shit, Game of Thrones, this shit looks hype, this shit looks hype. And you get into it and you realize very quickly this show does not have George R. R. Martin. Basically the lead chef in the restaurant of Game of Thrones. And so what happened, I, I, I kind of think of Game of Thrones, the show, and The Witcher as two different restaurants that have just opened. And what happened to Game of Thrones is they kind of fucked up whatever they were doing. So they have all of their, some of their best cooks coming and bleeding over into, um, you know, The Witcher restaurant. And I'm just calling it restaurant, not show, but it's easier to kind of you know, say that. Um, so... They have some of, let's just say, Game of Thrones best chefs coming over to The Witcher to, um, you know, try out some some new stuff, some new material. And it's very much the same visual style, the same fantasy style of uh, Game of Thrones. But Game of Thrones is so much more military and politically based in the world that the magic comes very much second, maybe even last. I don't even know if you want to call it second. Um, the Witcher puts the magic forward and the political intrigues to the back. And so just to kind of uh, navigate the waters, if you wanted to jump on this series, you have to know that the writing in this is just not nearly up to up to par of Game of Thrones. So let me just break it down real quick about some of the uh, the pros of this show, the pros interesting visuals like i said has very much of the game of thrones uh flair and cinematic style um locations I, I think there's tons of interesting locations in this that um game of thrones sometimes was a little bit dreary but i'm, I'm not trying to 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 do both a, a comparison between game of thrones it's just very easy to um the action the action in this show is pretty amazing um it very much felt like this director in the first couple episodes, it felt like they got action direct directors and they needed more dramatic directors. I'm not sure if they should have split split the direction and had someone handling the action and the other per, you know other people handling the dramatic stuff, but that was one thing I noticed. I you know, I was like, wow, this dramatic stuff is, you know, a little bit subpar, but the action is just making up for it in so many good ways. Um, the names, places, curses, spells, fantasy lore is, is hard to follow at first and might be hard to follow even through the entire series, but, um, you know, things are repeated and it, it, it's relatively clear, clear by the end of the show, um, who's good and who's, who's bad. The diversity in the cast is very strong. I will say something about the, uh, the diversity in Game of Thrones was very subpar for the majority of the uh, series. It followed generally Caucasian Europeans um, and put people of color in subservient roles. And so it, it it became a little bit obvious in that realm. And I was just like, this is just too much. You know, if it's fantasy, you don't if it's fantasy, why, why is there even slavery at all regarding, you know, race? Um, so anyways, um I will say the magic and the fantasy aspects of this is is fun to watch because uh, Game of Thrones was so limited in the spectrum of it, and I don't have tons of other uh, media that is 
successfully giving some amazing visuals with some decent action. Um, I'm, I'm enjoying the fantasy aspects. Cons. Okay, so there's a lot of... Uh, there's a handful of cons for me. Cons. The writing. I, I've already talked about it several times. It's not exactly... I don't think it's the staff writer's fault. It's just George R. R. Martin has a way with words that is just, uh, you know, magnificent. Rolls off the tongue, and I think everyone can agree that the first couple seasons with George R. R. Martin and Game of Thrones is substantially different from the last few seasons. And imagine having a show that doesn't have any George R. R. Martin in it. So that's, you know, that's what we got. Acting of the first two episodes was uh, was a little tough. As a matter of fact, for the entire series, you don't actually understand the trajectory of the story until about episode six, which is actually kind of interesting that they laid it out that way. Um, I, I can explain a little bit more in a uh, spoiler section. Um, I felt like I was always geographically lost in this world. I... I felt like almost every episode, it, this this season definitely walks a tightrope of being a serialized versus an episodic television show. But with having an episodic television show that you can binge, it doesn't necessarily feel like it leans as heavily on the episodic nature of it. So I did actually like this style. It's kind of one of the new newer styles I've seen on... Uh, binging recently i felt like the mandalorian was another example of uh shows that were doing that um i definitely felt like the world building of this um of the witcher the towns were so small that he traveled in and he mostly would stay in one or two locations um and they felt kind of underpopulated in some areas and the people felt just clean i felt like everyone I looked at the women that were supposed to be like running in the woods for a very long time, for, for long periods of time. Everyone just looked like they had just had a fresh shower and had someone, you know, got their hair all did. I was just very surprised about how clean everybody was. That was one thing that I definitely felt like Game of Thrones achieved in a way that the griminess of the world definitely felt real. Okay, so... um. Let me see. All right, so I have some specific notes I want to talk about within the season. If you have not seen The Witcher, I would go ahead and pause right now. Or if you don't give a shit, then hop on in. I will not say that this is one of the biggest uh, seasons that need to be um, dissected from a spoiler, spoiler free. But, I, you know, there's things I want to talk about. And uh, I think that if you are slightly interested in it, I would go ahead and check it out. It's... Um, it's entertaining. It's not Game of Thrones, but it's entertaining. And you don't have your expectations like Game of Thrones were supposed to, you know, how high they were. So it's a little bit easier to get down, in my opinion. So let's talk about spoilers for The Witcher. The first half hour was rough and dry. Lots of exposition, but starts to smooth out once uh, Yennefer comes into the picture, which is, I believe is the second episode. So I want to talk about the, uh, just real quick, the editing of this season. Evidently, we see a flash forward at the beginning of the series, and we have no idea what's going on. We just think we're going on this, like, you know, this, this trip with uh, Geralt, and suddenly episode, I think it's episode four, you realize that there has been some time shiftiness that we were shown we were shown him um at the beginning in or sorry we were shown series ending at the beginning of the season which we had no idea how relevant was how relevant the series plot line and her family and her grandmother and her i guess uh, was it her grandfather how relevant they were until like episode four or five. And, uh, I mean, Geralt and Siri don't even come across each other till, till, well, technically till them and then in the timeline, but, um, the, the fall of 
what is it, Nifgard or whatever the hell? Um, like I, I couldn't tell you where, who, who the good kingdom was and who the bad kingdom was. It was like way too many names I could think of at the moment. All I got is Geralt and Yennefer, and that was about it. But um, yeah, so the editing is very um, is is odd in this season. It's kind of edited like a movie would have been like having a flashback at the beginning of a season but or flash forward at the beginning of the season but it never felt clear that we were going through past time in episodes two three four and then four it just uh i don't know it it didn't didn't feel right i don't know if they were trying to do some westworld shit with the editing or something like that different timeline structures but i definitely felt like there was that the structure in this had kind of fallen flat and it, it it's not really a knock to the show unless you don't finish the show because you you just start out and you're like lost so i did feel like the show became 10 times more relatable once we got Yennefer on this uh introduced in the second episode i really felt henry cavill's performance being very subdued and <clears throat> Like, I mean, half of his answers were, <clears throat> or, <clears throat> or, <clears throat> you know, it was like 10 different hmms. And he's, ev- through the series, we found out his mother dropped him off at some place to get, to be turned into a witcher. And it's some sort of horrible process and it, it takes away your humanity and transforms you into a, or whatever, and not every witcher has white hair, evidently, I'm not really sure, but, um, yeah, I was, hmm, I was, <laughs> I like Henry Cavill as a performer, and I think he has a very, uh, amazing physical presence, but if he doesn't have, uh, a great director, like, I felt like a Taika Waititi would be amazing with Henry Cavill, just getting him to laugh or something like that, but, um, he's, he's very brooding and I didn't feel like there was much charisma to the show until we got Yennefer, who we automatically, um, feel sorry for just because of her deformities and, um, the way that her family and friends treat her. So it's just like, she, it's, it's very relatable to being an outsider and wanting to be accepted. Um, let me talk about... <laughs> Toss a coin to your witcher, oh valley, oh valley. So, um, so I'll just be like every other pod, generic podcaster and just sing the toss a coin song real quick. Um, but anyways, the song's good. I'm not gonna lie. I the the only problem with the song, in of course, in my opinion, is uh, did we uh, is it's uh sung by Joey Batley, who's Jaskier who I think a lot of people like. Um, he's from White Queen, CB Strike, The Riot Club. He must be from um, the UK or from something like that. Newcastle, sorry. Um, yeah, he's clearly involved in theatrical, um, theatrical media that requires him to sing. And I think that Joey Batley... As a as a performer is great. The thing is, the the toss a coin song just sounds like something Ed Sheeran came up with. Speaking of Ed Sheeran, straight off a of Game of Thrones, um, so uh, and he got tons of shit for being on Game of Thrones. Ed Ed Sheeran had a little old jig or a little song that he was like dun 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 dun. dun you know, I don't know if that's <laughs> it, it was uh um. <laughs> it wasn't seal it wasn't like baby I can do that awesome. it wasn't none of that but it was uh, <laughs> it was um the song that ed sheeran sang in game of thrones which was not 30 seconds i don't think felt so much more uh quote unquote fantasy like toss a coin to your witcher sounds like something fallout boy or panic at the disco made up just on the spot um it, it felt very modern and another thing, I was trying to figure out what the hell was he paying coins with? Like, I felt like he could kill anybody or force field, force punch somebody. Um, 
I was trying to figure out what the hell he was paying coins with. I felt like the only thing he really had an expense for was, you know, laying broads or laying pipe or whatever you want to call it. I was just like, what what does this guy need money for? I feel like I've hardly seen him do anything. So I do feel like I might need another explanation on that. Maybe I'll let, let, let everybody in the comments explain, you know, oh, he needs coins for horses, bro. He needs it for his place. He needs it for his house. He needs it for food. You know, I didn't see that. I didn't hear that. And it's me. You know, I did binge all eight episodes. So, um, you know, take it with a grain of salt, how much I actually retained from all of this uh, fantasy lore. But I, I, I tried. I tried my best. Um, took notes and everything. So, um, yeah, the, uh, episodes that I really thought were starting to, you know, hit that high marks were from two, three, and four were really, where I realized I was like, oh, this is getting kind of good. And around, I think it was like seven, eight was, was the wrapping up of the storylines that I, I really wanted to see. The, um, plot line of Siri. Let me, well, let, hold on. Let's go back to uh, Yennefer. Yennefer's transformation from becoming what she was to what she be she, she ends up being is pretty intense. For the majority of the season, they have some pretty decent CGI on the monsters, but not so much on the magic revolving around the humans. But the magic that happened on Anya um, was crazy i thought the transformation looked looked 10 out of 10 honestly it looked horrible painful they had to give her a hysterectomy or something like that to remove her organs reproductive organs which i do want to talk about that i i thought there was a couple plot lines with yennefer wanting to be accepted wanting to be a mother wanting to be you know self and you know independent and not have you know the world tell her what to do I did feel like it was kind of all over the place and I didn't really understand her motivation 100% of the time. I understood that, you know, she didn't want to be deformed, so she wanted to be beautiful, but to be beautiful, she couldn't be a mother. So she just kind of sacrificed one thing after another. But every time she would sacrifice something, she would have to, uh, every time she would want something back, she would have to sacrifice something else. And so uh, I, I did see the struggle that she was going along. I didn't see the motivations that she had. I know that she wanted to be wanted and, and, and whatnot. So I guess one thing that I probably should have mentioned before the spoiler section is that there is multiple years that are happening between episodes, which is completely unclear from um, my perspective um, until like the sixth or seventh episode. Like I, there's just like an offhanded comment like, oh, I haven't seen you in 10 years, Jasko. It's like, oh my gosh, it's like Jesus, like that, the, the de-aging in this was, was not done at all. I felt like I could barely tell who was who, uh, in what timeline basically. Um, old and old mouse sack. Can't forget about old mouse sack. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I really like the, um, uh, supporting characters as well. Adam Levy as Mousang, Lars Mickelson as Strigobor. Is he related to Mads Mickelson? Let me see. That would be pretty crazy if he was. Oh shit, playing as Lars and Mads Mickelson. Wow. I had no idea that uh Lars Mickelson was the brother of the guy that played Hannibal. Um that's pretty fascinating. He he does look like him now that I think about it. Um and let me see. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about Siri. Her plot line was one of the ones I tried to relate to the most, but her screaming, lion, bear, cub screaming ever so often just felt a little bit deus ex. Like, you know, she she seems to have this power that is kind of unexplained. By the way, Anya's half elf, and Siri is probably something. Um or she has something handed down from her um, family. Not exactly sure where we're going to go with that character, except for maybe Geralt helping her, uh, you know, explore who she is and maybe protecting her a little bit. But, I mean, she doesn't really seem to need that much protection. So one of the biggest complaints I have 
with the uh, the entire series was that I felt like there was like five or six different bad guys or antagonists, and I could never tell who was who. Like, who was... Normally, like in something like Star Wars, they have a roundtable discussion, and you can see everybody who's on the same team. It's very visually uh, spaced out, so you can see everybody on the team. I felt like we're jumping all over the map, and so since you have no geographic... Uh, I have no footing and no idea about where I am on the map. I can't tell where the good guys are versus where the bad guys are. And so normally it's like a left versus right type thing or a north versus south type thing or, you know, east versus west west type thing is what I meant. But um, it's very hard to tell who's on the good good side and the bad side. So Kahir is one of the guys played by Edmund Ferran. He's one of the, uh, I think, cadets or somebody. that I don't know. I say cadets. I don't even know what the hell he is. Um, obviously one of the bad guys, uh, Strega Boy, obviously, uh, probably one of the bad guys, but I, again, I couldn't really tell cause he was, he told Geralt that, you know, um, what's her face? Rafiki needed, to, what's her name? Rafiki? Renfri. <laughs> Rafiki's on Lion King. Renfri need to be killed. And so I'm still trying to figure out who's. Who's good? Who's bad? Why is Geralt working for Stregobor? Just a lot of things. Also, beginning of the show is a massive, unnecessary plot of female nudity. Um, it's clear that this season or that this series wants to be Game of Thrones in the way of violence and in a way of sexuality. I definitely don't think the sexuality uh, parts in this film or sorry in this show work on any level. I was close to board on every sex scene that was on screen and that seems impossible considering how you know gorgeous some of these people are so I was just like there there is one scene with like you know a fantasy orgy and I think that's probably the most uh, interesting part of the show when it comes to sex but honestly, I thought all of the sex scenes just, they weren't creatively shot. Nothing was interesting about it. They barely felt like, it didn't feel, it just felt like we have to have sex now because the script says so. And and, and the chemistry between the characters did not solidify that. Um, let me see. I think the one I'm thinking of the most is Jennifer and Geralt. They just, they're gorgeous people, but there's no reason for them to be hooking up. Um personally and Geralt feels like he's indifferent to having sex it, it, it felt like he could be having sex in, in this nothing just have no emotion it, it's even it's surprising to me he would even want to because he seems to have like such a slow motivation for anything so that's uh basically my hot take on uh what's it called the witcher let me see who directed the very final episode so we can kind of get a feel mark jobs he is best well known for director on daredevil the punisher 10 star and hannibal so he's actually worked with the uh, um the hannibal show and actually knowing that the, they worked some of the witcher um behind the scenes folks worked on hannibal is good to know because hannibal is an amazing television show so I, I really hope it improves in the same way. So, thank you for listening, watching The Witcher. Here is the information you need to know. Support the podcast by paypal.me slash the lockdown podcast. Comments, questions, concerns, email, Twitter, Facebook, Twitch, Instagram. The lockdown podcast at gmail.com, at lockdownpodcast.com. Sorry, at lucky dog podcast on twitter facebook instagram twitch all the youtube links are all down below thank you for listening watching toss a coin over here help us keep the lights on you already know what it is we got to keep the streams going we got to keep the podcasts flowing for you thank you for listening watching whatever you're doing join us take it easy why would i protect this i want to be powerful I will take the girl, protect her, and bring her back unharmed.
Do not tell me that this is finally the moment you've decided to actually care about someone other than yourself. Don't touch Roach. 